Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Geoscience Australia public lecture. Uh, first of all, I apologise for the short delay in us getting started, but we're ready now. So uh, I'd like to begin with a, an acknowledgement of country. Dawura Nuna, Dawura Nunawa, Yangu, Nagalawiri, Duni Manyan, Naganawawari, Dawurawari, Ningada, Dindi, Wangarali, Jinyan. Today, we are meeting you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. I also acknowledge that many of you are joining us from outside this country, and I extend that acknowledgement to the country you're joining us from and pay uh, our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, including the elders and any who may be joining us today. We are very privileged to have our guest speaker today, uh, Bradley Murridge. He has over 20 years experience in Aboriginal engagement, water and environmental science, and has worked in applied research, policy development, legislative re reviews and project management. He is a proud Murray from the Kamalaru, Kamalaru Nation. Kamalaru Nation, sorry, Bradley. Um, and is an associate professor in Indigenous water science, in hydrogeology and environmental science, and a part-time PhD candidate at the University of Canberra. He has a long list of awards, and I'd like to read some of these to you because I think they are very significant, um, and, and positions in the community. He is an Indigenous Liaison Officer for the Threatened Species Recovery Hub under the National Environment Science Program, or many of you will know this as NISP, it's part of the Australian Government. In 2009, he was named the CSIRO Indigenous STEM Career Professional, an ACT Tall Poppy Science Award winner, an ACT NAIDOC Scholar of the Year, and he received the inaugural Academy of Science Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Travel Award. He is also a fellow, fellow excuse me, of the Peter Cullen Trust and International Water Centre Leadership Course. So very accomplished, uh, Bradley, indeed. Uh, his seminar today has had a long gestation. In 2005, he completed a master's thesis at the University of Technology in Sydney and then the National Centre for Groundwater Management titled Aboriginal People and Groundwater. This looked at the relationship in Australia between Aboriginal people and groundwater. He reviewed the dreaming art and oral history and observations that were made by missionaries, surveyors, explorers and others, right up to that year where he was doing that work. It remained unpublished, Brad tells us, until he was encouraged to publish, publish it under the same title, Within Springs of the Great Australian Basin a special issue of the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Queensland. And today's presentation, he'll explore uh, that thesis and that, that uh, publication. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bradley to the stage. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we're underway. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I gave a talk a number of years ago here and um, had a good crowd. That was pre-COVID, obviously, but it was, um, it was talking about Aboriginal people and geoscience. So I was thought I'd explore that a bit more, but this is sort of my, my passion and love, um, Aboriginal people and groundwater. Um, thanks for that introduction. And obviously the acknowledgement in language is 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 awesome. Yeah, that's that's great to see. Just some some photos will have some, some old people in it and um, that have passed away and um, they're obviously part of my crew and um, I just want to give you the heads up if you want to look away you can so the next photo <laughs> you can look away. Um, look I acknowledge none all country live here. Um, I'm living the dream. I live on Marbo Boulevard. Um, that's after Eddie Marbo of course. Um, so it's um, been here for 11 years and you know, I acknowledge this country every day and thank the Ngunnawal people for allowing me to be on this country. Um, I have a good relationship with with, with elders and, and obviously knowledge holders in this country and, you know, I'm, I'm potentially here to give them um, some, some information that they can fire away at governments. 
um, if they want. Um, but it's and obviously acknowledging everyone that's on online and acknowledge those countries that that you're on as well. And and thanks for, thanks for coming online. Um, so yeah, that's that's my mob, Kuna my mob. So yeah, we we do go up into Queensland. So we are Murrays or Maris, um, not Maris, Maris, M A R I, the role they are. And um, so yeah, we're right in the thick of groundwater country, um, right at the, the base of the springs and um, the Great Artesian Basin. So groundwater has always been a, an interesting um, part for me, and, and, and took it on board. And and as I got as I got older, I started to learn more and more about the connection to groundwater. And um, I did geology in the early days, straight out of uni, and um, had a great experience. Love learning about the earth, and and did some exploration in the Great Sandy Desert, and come home and said, I don't think I want to be a geologist. I don't want to dig up. I think I want to fill in. So I did environmental science and changed to that, and and then did groundwater in later years, um, early two thousand, sort of let's say the turn of the century, um, early 2000s. So, yeah, that the photo on the on the left is, um, yeah, four generations. We actually had six generations while Nan was alive. Um, she had 14 children. Uh, Mum's one of 14, so I have a crazy amount of cousins. Um, we, did a, we did a head count of descendants from Nan and Pop, and there was around 229 descendants just from her and, and, and Pop. So um, there's a lot of us. And, um, yeah, so I suppose the, why I'm doing it is for them and also the future generations to come. And those old people there are, um, are you know, are her, her father is the young fella with the overalls and the hat at the front, front right, um, the taller of the two young, young fellas. And then behind him is her grandparents. So we're very lucky to have a photo of that age, sort of late 1800s, uh, she was born in 1918. So yeah, we're very lucky to have that. What I'll do is introduce the paper, some of the content, some of the findings, talk about my 15 minutes of time, um, pieces put to good use, and some of the opportunities. And I think while I've got a captive audience, I will put the challenge out there and have a list of demands. Um, Cultural value water. So this is what I've been talking about the last 20 odd years. Some of these slides haven't changed for all that time. Um, and if people have, were members of IAH in New South Wales, I gave this talk back in the day in the early 2000s, and then I think I've given it to IAH ACT chapter as well. So there's some, some familiar slides you might see or wording. So, you know, water is a key part of who we are, and, you know, it's it's, it's in everything, you know, it's in the dances, it's the dreaming stories, the art, the song. So it's it's heavily connected to, to Aboriginal people in a national context. And I suppose my journey has, has led me on to trying to reconnect with some of that traditional water knowledge and use Indigenous methodologies on the way we think and feel and do and be. So that's that's been my sort of challenge is, is you know, I might, may be trained in Western ways. Um, and I, you know, I think that's 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 a good thing. But also looking at how the two can melt together, you know, looking at how old people, how old people knew water, um, tell our stories our way. So I got tired of hearing non-Indigenous people tell our stories. That's what I got tired of. And I thought, no, I'm going to tell my stories my way, and I'm going to enter that space, infiltrate the system, give talks at Geoscience Australia, <laughs> things like that. You know, just just to, to, to do it our way, um, you know, and obviously cultural safety is a key part of, of where you are and you want to make sure that you, you facilitate that and then obviously work towards identifying and then and protecting those, those water places and then more in a Western point of view is, a, is, is validate the science and change the academies, influence the academies to think differently. Uh, that's, that's my other challenge as well. So this is... Um, this is day one in the colony. It's a meme from Facebook. Um, any chance you can show us how to find water. So, you know, those sort of things, we've been giving knowledge from day one, um, and then it sort of stopped for a while when we were humans, and um, now I think the time is right for traditional knowledge to influence the way we manage country. 
So, yeah, as, as was mentioned, I did the, the master's thesis in um, 2005. I had Noel Merrick as a supervisor. And at that time, I was looking to do, um, I was doing the, the master's exter external, externally through UTS, the National Centre, and um, I got to the point where I didn't have a thesis. And I wanted to do urban salinity in Western Sydney because it was just starting to rear its ugly head and starting to crumble places around 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 Western Sydney. And I thought that might have been a good idea. And then I, I moved to the EPA, New South Wales, and then it was actually Noel that was in my sister-in-law's pizza shop in Gerringong, um, saw a painting of mine and said, guess oh, you're Aboriginal, aren't you? I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you do Aboriginal people on ground? And I said, well, I'd love to, but I've just done hydrogeophysics and hydrogeochemistry and modelling and, you know, all this sort of thing. And he said, look, mention the word groundwater and I'll mark it. So, you know, that, that was a, a push for me to, to start this process. And I thought, I'm gonna, and then as I got into it, um, I thought, you know, this is an unexplored area, especially in the groundwater space. And um, Professor Angela Arlington, who's a surface water ecologist, um, she's come to the, the good side of water, the, the underground water. Um, she's seen the light and um, she, she encouraged me to, to um, submit and publish because she was um, editing or co-editing, or well, she was lead editor of the, the Royal Society of Queensland Gab Spring Edition. So I went, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll have a crack. So that's 16 years later, so never give up on your papers. Um, I, I got it out there. And when I looked at it, and I, as I was putting this presentation together, a lot of things haven't changed. It's still the same issues, still the same challenges. Um, and I'll talk through some of those things that I, that I worked with. So originally I wanted to look at Aboriginal groundwater licences and, and connections that way in a physical sense. Were they actually extracting groundwater? Were they using groundwater? Did they have licences? But around that time, some of you might know George Gates. So he was he was lead in New South Wales at that time and um, Liz Ellis was there as well. So there was a good groundwater crew, but, you know, talking to them, there was just no data, you know, on – there was no identifier. There was no sort of box to tick unless it was – Unless you did a word search, which I did many years later, you know, that was had Aboriginal Land Council, Native Title, Cultural Group, Elders Group, you know, it's, it, or an Aboriginal sort of sounding name, or, or if it was Brad Mogridge that had a groundwater licence, you wouldn't know unless you knew me that I was Aboriginal and I had a groundwater licence, so, which I don't, which I'd love. Um, so the challenge was that I thought, I got, I got nothing now, I don't have a thesis, and then you just sort of, it sort of expanded more chats with um, Noel and um, I started to look at the, the relationship Aboriginal people have with groundwater. There's sort of been no collective study in that space. And I, I thought, what are the opportunities to, to look a bit more broader, look nationally? Um, and so I worked through, you know, the dreaming stories come out very strong and obviously the groundwater um, and the rainbow serpent is quite strong in a lot of those dreaming stories. Survival in the driest and habitat continent on Earth knowing where groundwater, shallow aquifers um, and, you know, um, alluvial systems are and accessing that groundwater in a dry country, art was very prevalent, the oral histories and then any observations that were out there that I could find of, of you know, when you when you start moving into the, the, the desert country, you know, the, these places, groundwater is going to be a key part um, of, of survival. And obviously up to modern day, I had a look at what was, what was there at that point, as I said, was 2005. So also thinking about the diversity of Aboriginal Australia and, you know, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia, Australia, that every mob is different. And um, you, you'll find that if you start engaging um, with communities that, you know, the language is different, the law is different, the landscape, you know, we've got all the different types of landscapes in this, in this country from alpine regions just down the road to, to desert, to tropics, to to um, semi-arid, um, wet sclerophyll, dry sclerophyll. So we've got all these landscapes and Aboriginal people are, have adapted to all of those. Um, cultural practice, and then we move into sort of modern challenges, the capacity of these communities to engage. They're obviously their status, where they are. Have they got native title? Have they not got native title? Do they own land? Do they not own land? And then do they own water and all that sort of stuff? So, and then the governance. They might own water, but they don't know what to do with it. Um, they just pay the admin costs every year. Um, so I suppose then I looked at 
some of these dream type stories of which pop up and then they were the ones that were just in the available literature in books and things like that and so it was you could sort of see um, these, these dream time stories that had connections to groundwater and in the in the paper I put a few in few of the small ones and you know, there's some South Australian ones there but as I said the rainbow serpent was strong in the, the time of creation around these stories and even for us up in Camilloy country we have the Gadiar, which is in a, a deep water hole, which connects to the McIntyre in, in the dreaming story and to other lagoons in the region. And it's a snake with a crocodile head. You know, so those sort of stories are there. And we don't go to that, that lagoon, it's highly significant. And that was that's the photo that I have on my front page. So these sort of cultural beings and and are prevalent in a lot of these, a lot of these stories. And when you when you look deeper into it, like um, they they will use springs as their portal, um, so they'll move from the surface and go through the springs, and come out and do their bit on on land. And then stories around, you know, if a spring dries up, that means the snake has moved or or it's died or you know someone's done something wrong. And then obviously there's there's cultural business in the way. Um, one that didn't fit was quite long was Gorongatch and, and Merrigan. That's like a, a a story west of Sydney, so Cox's River, Janol and Cave. So that story survived at the time of peak colonisation. And as, you know, they, that story was lucky to survive. And I suppose it talked about, you know, how I think it was, a, I can't remember the, the being, um, but they were chasing each other throughout the landscape and creating all these landscapes. So, yeah, it was, a, it was quite a cool story. And I actually got approval from some of the, the Gundagara mob to actually publish it. So that was quite exciting. So this one popped up as well. Um, I've used it a million times in, in presentations. And, you know, what it is is a um, conventionalised map on, a, on the back of a spear thrower. Um, there was an anthropologist engaging with a with an old man, a knowledge knowledge man in the, I think it was the 60s, yeah. And, um, and what at the end of their time together, so there was obviously language and, and things being transferred between the two of them. And what that was, was, you know, this is in desert country and all these concentric circles were carved into the back of the spear thrower. And what they were that was this old man's knowledge of his country, uh, all the water holes in the desert. So that sort of stuff is, you know, I think that's pretty cool. That's amazing that he knows. And every single one of those had a traditional name. So I suppose if any of those dried up, that traditional name could could go with it. Um, so the importance of language connection as well. So, you know, in, in modern day terms, that's a GIS layer for you, you know, um, cultural landscape across, across that old man's country. One thing I ask every crowd is why does Australia not celebrate Aboriginal people's water knowledge? I don't know. I just ask that question every time and get people to think about it. You know why? Why? Why don't we have a say in the driest inhabited continent on Earth? One of the oldest living cultures on the planet have a say in water. Yeah. So that I don't know. I think that's a fair question. Found that map, and you know the map is is pretty cool to display. Um, you know a lot of rivers. You know you can see the Murray Darling there, sort of in the the southeast and the to the northwest of it. You can see the Lake Eyre Basin, and then obviously all the tropic tropical rivers, and then. You can see those ones that only flow when it rains in the desert country. And to know water in that part of the world, I think is pretty amazing as well. So I'll talk to you a bit about cultural values now. And it comes through um, strongly that I uh, find literature on. But then today, and you know, the soaks and soakages and native wells and springs, mound springs, bores in a modern context, hanging swamps in sandstone country. Um, and that they were there was a lot of literature around them, so you could sort of talk about those. And then I did a painting. Um, I just had it in my head, uh, painted it, and then speaking to one of the one of my elders, that you sort of said, you know, you've painted these sites, and I've never been to those sites. So that's just something I believe is, is built in. You know, it's um, stories are built in, connection to place is built in, and you don't know it until you go there, or, or you know, I happen to paint it. These are just some more values that I've been tracking through through time. You know, creation sites, as I said, you know, the rainbow serpent and those song lines that link from place to place are usually water places. So that, that's quite a strong connection. I showed you that that 
picture of that old man, um, spear thrower, that language is important, especially with water sites. Resource sites, water sites will have resources around them, have, or if you if they're not there, then obviously they will turn up like animals and things like that. But after fresh water, you know, you will see a change in the landscape. And obviously, you know, reeds pop up and things like that. So they are important for, for you know, certain men's and women's business. Is there yes, a gender specific business? So in my country, some of the groundwater sites are women's sites, so I need to be very careful about where I go and what I talk about. Um, and so I obviously try and get clearance when I go to places. Uh, is there any places I shouldn't be going um, as part of the research? So ceremonial sites as well are around, always around water. Burial places are going to exist around water. This is a, a photo to show a cultural landscape. So you've got, you know, nice bubbling groundwater in the foreground and uh, surf water in the back. Uh, like Puri, and then there's just artifacts everywhere. So that those values and that connection and that existence of that mob at that place is there because of water. So I suppose how do we how do we maintain that water, but also protect those values as well? Surface water, groundwater, interconnected values. They are out there, no doubt. You know, we all know that you know some rivers don't flow without groundwater. And you know that that knowledge potentially is there, um, but no one's no one's asked the mob. Teaching sites, when you go to a place, um, there's going to be knowledge passed down from generation to generation, and that that teaching aspect is a key part of water. The the sad bit, you know, there are massive sites out there, and they're all a lot of them are around water, um, you know, next to rivers, next to water holes, uh, because that's where they're camping. Um, then water specific species. Are going to always be dependent on water, and I, that, that was my view of joining the threatened species hub when I started the PhD. Was that threatened species are thirsty as well, so they need water. Um, totemic species, cultural keystone species. So the top, the top species in your cultural connection to a place, you know, it could be the eagle, it could be brolga, and if they're turning up to your water place, that's a good sign. Um, so I suppose these keystone species are important, or the Murray Cod in the, in the Murray River, you know, things like that. Um, what a dependent ecosystem connections. No one's asked us. Cultural economy is important, especially in these places. So trade would have happened, um, physical. And then obviously the more modern context, you know, the seasonal indicators, they're starting to weave their way into um, seasonal calendars. So, you know, the Bureau... Meteorology has a lot of those seasonal calendars online and, you know, those indicators are a key part of advising of when seasons change. These are just, um, this is an important place in my country. Just over the border in Queensland, um, Wengallan, it would have been a stopover point to, to other cultural places. So, you know, the, these, these water places are very significant. It's a shame we have to put a fence around it, but... So I go. So some of my conclusions. Um, is it, there's a bit of text there. Um, over the many thousands of years, Aboriginal people have accumulated a comprehensive and astounding knowledge of groundwater. These factors need to be taken in consideration by governments, local, state, and or national when planning decisions are made. That way, that may affect the quality and quantity of that groundwater. If we want Australia to protect the resource for future generations, then Aboriginal people must be involved in the decision process. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's a fair statement. Um, another one is why I'm still doing this. Um, this study is conducted on Aboriginal people in groundwater. You know, and I found that, um, you know, there was a few regional ones. There was a Western Water Study in WA back in the early 90s, but, you know, very few had, had touched on, on groundwater. Um, and I think the relationship Aboriginal people have with groundwater is, is very much un, untapped. Um, the, as I said, the paper tried to record the beginnings of my groundwater research and the relationship, dreamtime stories and cultural knowledge. My intention was and still is to inspire other Aboriginal people and research to take the subject matter further. So I suppose publishing publishing my master's thesis 16 years later was, was doing walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Um, and I'm, just at UC, you know, I've, I was encouraged um, by my supervisor, we've got a a PhD at the moment to look at the relationship between groundwater and refugia in the Murray Darling Basin. So there's a there's a link there at the moment, and you know I'd love obviously allow an Aboriginal person to apply, but you know I know the 
being a member of IAH for the last 20 odd years, there's only three of us. So there's, there's, a, there's a small field. Hopefully there's more out there, we just haven't found them. So this was my first eight minutes of fame. Um, so I, I had um, UTS put it online and obviously once it's online, the thing called the internet, people find it. And ABC Science did a story. Um, then Quenching Australia's Thirst was an interview on, on radio with Boston Radio Station. Um, which was which was cool. Talking about my research, and there was a story in the Australian, um, and so it sort of built from that. And then it went a bit quiet. And then, yeah, recently I was interviewed by BBC. Uh, there was a bit of a documentary done. And then last year at at Australia, uh, two years ago at Australian Groundwater Conference um, in Brisbane, we had a an Aboriginal or Indigenous groundwater session. So it was the first time IAH had had um, built the confidence to have one and after 20 years of pressing um, we got there and you know I think we had a New Zealand Maori lad talk about rising groundwater levels impacting on his charcoal caves in his lot in his limestone caves so that, that was cool so we come across the come across the ditch um, had these um, had a young hydrogeologist talk about a project in the in the in the Great Sandy Desert with women rangers. And the day before we found out the women rangers turned up from the Great Sandy Desert to Brisbane and we didn't know they were coming. And um, so we got them tickets and obviously Steve presented his paper and they just talked about their cultural values in, in, the, in the desert and what they're doing with, with obviously Western science and Steve. And um, to see them talking about their country was was beautiful, you know, as they were so proud of, of their work. And it, in the end, that that presentation got talk of the conference. So you, I suppose the IAH is a bit more a bit more comfortable now with Aboriginal people and groundwater. So hopefully that'll find itself in the um, agenda or the program for Perth later this year. Um, I was nominated to be part of the committee, so I've, I've got to find some time for that as well. So I think there will be a an Indigenous session in um, in Perth this year, which would be good. So putting the thesis to, to good, um, there was a National Water Commission project at looking at putting groundwater into the, the curriculum. And uh, this was this uh, a, a site called Wet Rocks, um, and it put a lot of my thesis into that into that curriculum. And obviously that that was really cool. Um, and you know, it's it's a resource there for teachers. And then the other one was um, I coordinated the water curricula for Melbourne Uni. They got some funds to, to build Indigenous knowledge of water, astronomy and fire. And so I helped run the, uh, I coordinated the water one, which, you know, obviously used the, uh, the groundwater thesis as well. So um, it's, still, it's still finding itself as relevant, which, which is fantastic. And I suppose having it now published, you know, it can, it can go a bit further. So the status of where we're at with cultural, in, Aboriginal cultural values and groundwater. So I don't know if you've read the, the National Groundwater Strategic Framework, 2016 to 2026. I always do a word search whenever I get a PDF. Um, I find cultural pops up a lot, but it's in agricultural. Um, and I find native always ferns, turns up in al alternative. Um, so. And I deal with the obvious is like Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations, First Peoples, First First This, First That. And then, yeah, obviously you find out where, where the titles are. So that's it. That's what we've got to hang on in the National Groundwater Strategic Framework by the federal government. That's it. So how are we going to do that? There's no implementation opportunity. There's no strategy. That's all you've got. Um, the other one is the GDE Atlas. Um, they're the, the types. Zero. So I suppose those are the, I was at CSRO when this was being developed. Put my hand up a number of times. Data scope. Got no money for that. Tired of that. Yeah, so I suppose those sort of things, when you were thinking about this space, th these are definitely relevant to, to groundwater. Uh, the whole of the geoscience strategy. You don't get off either. So these are the two points. 
you know, we make commitments to respectfully engage and collaborate with First Peoples, Australia's original mappers. And I think that's great. And I suppose what happens next is important. And then obviously we'll respectfully engage and collaborate with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So that's fantastic. So what happens next is the bit I want to look at. Yeah. And that's like, you know, an acknowledgement of country. Everyone does an acknowledgement. But what, what do you do after that? You know, what, what are you doing to change that? You know, um, I suppose it's, it's become normal, which is fantastic. And then obviously hearing it in, in not all languages is even better. So I suppose the challenge is for these for agencies is if, you know, you have an acknowledgement up in front of your legislation or your, or your policy documents, and that's it. That's not good enough. I suppose part of my role is to keep people accountable. And this, this is my list of the NATs. So Aboriginal Groundwater Office units in each state and territory, um, National Aboriginal Groundwater Council, National Aboriginal Groundwater Science and Centre of Excellence, GS Science Australia. There you go. Groundwater research led by Aboriginal peoples, cultural groundwater science that comes out of that. Um, national Aboriginal Groundwater Strategy with some truth telling. And then obviously a, a National Aboriginal Groundwater Holder. It's, uh, I'll happily do that job. I reckon that'll do. It's all my, uh, my water selfies. <laughs> I've got a thousand of them. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, look, Bradley, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, just as I start to look to see if we've got any online questions, I'll throw to the audience first. Uh, questions for Bradley? Comments? Uh, Ole, up the back. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I think it is a good initiative. Um, I've been pushing for river ranges and I suppose now we can push for groundwater ranges. You know, when you think about desert mobs, the, the mound springs, that's all they've got. You know, they're, they're the ones they're protecting. But the other challenge is that it's only one year's funding. So by the time you get training and your shirts, thanks, off you go. Yeah, so that if it if it's an ongoing initiative and it's successful, then yeah, then we'll we'll call it call it good. But I suppose the challenge is obviously you know whether they're just testing the waters to see if they do get applications, and it, it becomes successful, then you know that 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 might be where they're at. And if it does become successful, then that'll be a good thing. Yeah. Obviously, they also offered 40 mil for water entitlements um, in the in the Murray Darling Basin. So um, that was about two and a half, three years ago, and none of that money has hit the ground yet. So that's another challenge. Yeah, yeah. I take a question online. Uh, I see one here. It's come in from one of our staff, actually, Marina Costello. She's interested to know if you you will be presenting at the Australian Earth Geo Science Convention in uh, 2021. So that's in September in Brisbane. Uh, at it. Yeah. I know, I know AGC, the Australian Groundwater Conference. But yeah, the Geo Science one, I don't know. So, Bradley, I know that you're um, working with our teams here at Geoscience Australia, and maybe we this is something that we can help you with. Draw some of the dots between some of the other geoscience conventions that are that are happening, you know, on an annual or biannual basis, and give you a few more forums, perhaps, where you you can talk. So I'm yeah. happy to take that on. Actually, I have um, between one and three a.m. on Tuesdays available. Oh right, yeah, <laughs> it does sound like you're very busy. So maybe we'll take a ticket or something. <laughs> Um, uh, question from the audience. Yes, please. Yeah, look, I, that hasn't really been touched in, in, in any research proposal. Um, NESP 2 will start up soon. Um, I'm not sure how much water and groundwater research will be in that. 
So that could be an opportunity. I know there's definitely climate change. There used to be a climate change hub in the previous, in NESP1. So there could be opportunities through that. Um, I know in Northern Australia, there's been a lot done, especially around the, the carbon carbon um, farming and um, burning programs. There's been a lot happening in Northern Australia, but no doubt as less rainfall, especially as we get hotter and drier, there's gonna be less, you know, less recharge and some of these springs will dry up. I suppose seeing seeing on my country the, the cap and ball program that, that happened through, through parts of that country, you know, where you just drilled a hole and this magnificent water come out. Um, so they're, they're being capped and some of the old springs are starting to, to revive themselves. So those stories are becoming um, alive again, you know. So I suppose that aspect of the cap and ball program, reducing wastage and evaporation, um, because they were just going into bore drains and running, and that was it, you know. And I suppose now that those some of those springs are, are getting some of their their life back into them because there's water available now, not not running on the surface, then that could be a good thing. But yeah, definitely climate change is going to have a bigger impact. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. A question from online. We've got one here from Tilly Hinton. Uh, who says that she's been thinking lately about how in the planning and environmental regulation sphere that artefacts are seen as the main validation for a landscape being culturally significant, but actually the landscape having ongoing access to um, its water and cultural significance uh, is, you know, came across in your presentation. And she'd like to hear a little bit more about, about that. How do we make sure we capture those? Yeah. Uh, so I suppose, yeah, in the in that planning process, that cultural values are just more than stones and bones. The old saying, you know, is that the the non physical aspect of heritage rarely gets protected. Um, you know, you look at the um, the water trigger in the EPBC Act does not consider cultural values. Does not. Um, there's cultural heritage acts out there that are that I suppose that are evolving to consider the non physical. Um, and those stories and those connections in that cultural landscape that, you know, one water hole at the top of the catchment connects to the one at the bottom of the catchment and that whole landscape is significant, you know, and I suppose that that is starting to appear in planning, but when it, um, but the protection measures we see are still void of, of you know, there's no veto to say no, you cannot. I think in parts of the Northern Territory under, the, under their Land Rights Act, you can say no. But other other states, there's still the power of of lobbyists and money to actually get what they want, and I suppose we can sort of see that in recent activities in in the cultural heritage space. You know, Jugend Gorge, and obviously the the challenge of of trying to amend the the Fitzroy River and um, things like that. So there's there's challenges out there for us, and you know, like even thinking about, I grew up in Western Sydney and New South Wales, worked with. EPA and then moved into national parks for a while in policy and you could sort of see that you know then the uh, the maximum fine for a person knowingly destroying Aboriginal heritage was 5,500 first offence. You won't get that first offence. You'll get a conviction sometimes. Most of the times you won't and 5,500 is the same fine for serving someone under 18 alcohol. How's that protecting the oldest living culture on the planet? So there was changes in, in, in New South Wales to see more powers and more increased fines in the National Parks and Wildlife Act. So those sort of things have changed, but they still need to go a bit further. And, you know, like even native title, native title does not give you veto to say no. You can say no to negotiate and you go to um, mediation and you go to, and then someone else will make a decision for you. So I suppose that, that aspect is still got a long way to go, yeah. Maybe another question from. Yeah. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's, it's, I suppose it's a part of that is acknowledging the past. And to know where you've come from is going to help where you're going to go. You know, that's a lot of the old sayings. You hear that. And we've seen it in, in other similar 
colonised countries like Canada, um, New Zealand. New Zealand have a treaty, we don't. Um, but truth telling is all about yeah, in the water space. I'll give you an example. So I, I normally have a slide on on water 101, where it says, you know, like our you know our land and waters were amended, taken. Our people were put on missions and reserves. Our land was was you know we were separated from our land. So that's my mum's generation. That's not hundreds of years ago. That's my mum's generation. She was born as a ward of the state, non-human. You know, she were, wasn't seen as a as a member of the, of the Australian public. It wasn't until the late 60s where they were counted as humans, you know. So I suppose, and as we come out of, of, of that space, all the good land and water was gone. So our country had been carved up into cadastral maps on, on of ownership. And it was, you know, that sort of truth-telling needs to be told in, in, in water. So it's where we've come from. And, you know, I'm helping out now with the, I'm co-chairing the Committee on Aboriginal Water Interests, which is giving advice on the, the refresh of the National Water Initiative. So, you know, things like that, there has to be truth-telling around water because when we look at water in New South Wales, let's say, most of the, you know, the caps there, the Murray-Darling Basin cap west of the divide, if, if my mum wants water on her country, she's got to go to the market and buy it. So that, that's that's the truth of it all is that, we, you know, and there was a study done recently by um, Lana Hartwig that talked about, you know, in New South Wales, the last 10 years in water, Aboriginal water ownership, it's 0.02%, so it's bugger all, and that 0.02% has dropped 17% in the last 10 years. So the access and ownership of water, which, which is the other thing that Aboriginal people don't get is the separation of the two, the land and water. So telling that story as well is that, you know, we saw... Aboriginal populations go up during the millennium drought in some of this, this dry country and some of the non-Indigenous population reduce. But when you, if they were selling their water entitlements and retiring, whereas our mobs, if they didn't have water, if they didn't have land and they didn't have water, then they're already, already behind the eight ball. And then, land, you know, with the reforms that happened, they separated the two, become two, two markets. So further disenfranchised Aboriginal people. So those sort of truths um, need to be told as well, you know. So that, that's why we're where we're at, that we don't hold water. If we hold land pre the separation of land and water, we would have potentially had water entitlements. Um, you know, there are some communities, land councils that through the New South Wales Land Rights Act got land and with that they were coupled with water. And so that some of them are actually trading on the temporary market. So trading their water entitlement to build up their, their revenue and opportunities to use that water in, in the future. And then I suppose the big the big threat for them is floodplain harvesting that's coming, that's going to hit them and Aboriginal people will be, again, disenfranchised. They won't have a licence in floodplain harvesting. Yeah, so there's, there's sort of some of the water truths that I wonder that I raise, yeah. All right, we still have a little bit more time, so I'm going to take another question from up online from Tian Ahn Tran. I have been I understood that the geography science in Australia is very important, especially the underwater for Australians. Currently, I am researching the impact of environmental factors which impact on the groundwater in Australia, in particular in Sydney. How about your views on the trend in this research? Um, I suppose the uh, impacts on groundwater is um, obviously extraction is a big a big challenge, and then we've got some of these new ones that pop up like the the PFAS issue. So some communities rely on groundwater, and they're going to be contaminated by PFAS that, that been past activities. It's like the the newest bestos. That's and you know there's I go to the the Jervis Bay a lot. You know I talk to the the Booteri mob, and and you know they've got the real challenge that they can't access part of their country because of this contamination. So Contamination is, is is a big thing, especially in, in Western ways. Um, and in Sydney, well, it's, there's a lot of toxic places in Sydney. They're working for the EPA. Back in the day, you know, you saw yellow ooze coming out of the ground on the Parramatta River. And as the, the river cat was, ex, you know, eroding the bank, more and more was getting exposed. So, and there was asbestos everywhere, the old 
the old sites there. You know, you can, those sort of can, historical contamination sites, you've got to look where the Olympics was. You know, that, that place was nasty. Um, so contamination is, is, is a big issue for groundwater systems, but I suppose the, the missing link is, is Aboriginal people's input to that. Yeah. Another question from the floor here. In fact, also looking at a strategy book, that's not meant to be changing and probably things to do with that address at the moment. So that elaborated bit, um, which hasn't really collected the sort of things around. Yep. So within the groundwater uh, domain, what would you like to see from the geosciences Australia to go? What would I like to see? I suppose engagement is, you know, is, is when you start thinking of a research project, ensuring that Indigenous knowledge is up front in the terms of reference so it can't be excluded down the track to say it's out of scope uh, or we've got no money for that. So it's it's funded and catered for up front in those big projects. So I was on the First People's Water Engagement Council advising the National Water Commission back in the day, and you're seeing all these multi-million dollar research projects. And, you know, one was a GD Atlas. And you could see the opportunities there, but they weren't in the terms of reference. They just weren't there. Um, and then so consultants have got the jobs. Oh, no, we can't do that. That'll cost too much. And I suppose it's ensuring that if you start thinking about large-scale research and projects and engagement that that, it, that is there up front, um, that's a good start. And then obviously how you maintain that progress throughout the whole project. Um, and then obviously there's, I think about, um, talk about reciprocity, you know, that what's in it for the mob, you know, what's in it for Aboriginal people. If they're going to engage with a, 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 um, a government agency, what's in it for them? Because, you know, they've been burnt too many times, you know, and you probably know that, that, you know, the, a researcher turns up with a question they want answered and the elders can help him answer that question. You know, they're, they're putting a stop to that, yeah. So they're sort of saying, how about you come and have a chat, um, sit down with us, and let's talk about what are our research issues, what do we want researched? And we found that in the threatened species space that it's flipping the paradigm on research in general. So it's, it's about um, building relationships. Um, it takes time, um, and I, I give the three T's. Um, Ex, um, I use the three T's a lot in explaining this. So it takes time to build trust over lots of cups of tea. So they're your three T's. And then obviously you, you can get to the point where the mob will say, look, we have concerns about this spring. Some days it's cloudy, some days it's milky. Why, why is that? You know, I suppose it's, it's how can the research space change the way it does business and start getting the communities to to put forward their research ideas. And I think that that rarely happens in in, in, in science, especially. Um, what else? I suppose employment opportunities, job shares, um, you know, because I'm building up for world domination in the end. So it's, it's around my Aboriginal water unit will dominate the world. <laughs> but yeah, look, there's, yeah, there's more to talk about, I suppose, yeah. I do have one more question online, which I'll go to, and then maybe Donna will come to you and I think we'll draw it to a close then. Uh, so it starts with a comment. It's from Libby Larson. Um, water extraction in NT, uh, particularly groundwater, uh, significant concerns around the over-allocation of aquifers and the just saying the lack of policy and regulation. Um, she's asking you around your thoughts on the mechanisms for engagement of Aboriginal people people in these processes. Um, would you like to elaborate on that? that? That's obviously going to be an issue, and especially when you've got un unallocated systems to a point that it's, they're, going to, they're going to be allocated very soon. And I suppose I think there was that 40 gig licence recently in the Northern Territory of groundwater. So that, that's really scary for the mob. And, you know, some parts of the, the Northern Territory, it might be 80% Aboriginal land population and ownership, but they're not going to get that free water. Someone else is. You know, that Murray-Darling Basin refugee that moves north, 
may get that water. And you know, I suppose that's happening in the West as well. So it's it's going to be a big challenge to make sure that how a government's going to do it right this time and learn from the Murray-Darling Basin. You know, there's there's many examples of where it's failed us here in the basin. So I suppose the North definitely can learn. And obviously it, it's up to the governments to make sure that they have Indigenous people at the tables when they're planning and talking about water. So I know the Northern Territory has strategic Aboriginal reserves legislated um, and in policy. So that is that is a great opportunity. But I suppose what will they get out of that? What what is the reciprocity back to communities in this unallocated system? And I think I don't think there's any fees per se in the Northern Territory. I know there's none in Tassie. You know things like that where there's systems that are fully allocated or over allocated. The only way to get water in those those markets is go to the market and buy it, but it has to be available as well. So these these places where they're starting to allocate water, it's well, it's, it's, we're going to be watching closely. But the challenge is it might be too late, and that's what we're worried about. But I think it's it's going to be a big issue for the mobs in the north. Uh, might take one last question from the floor. I don't know if you had your hand up before. Fantastic. Thank, thanks for that comment. And actually, Donna, I think that's a good segue for us to join one more time in thanking Bradley. <laughs> I would like to say I really liked your three T's. They were um, time, trust, and tea. And I know that we shared a coffee together this morning. And I know also that you are actually meeting with the groundwater team after this presentation. So, look, I'd like to thank you for your time today for the presentation and for meeting with us because we definitely recognise you're a very busy person, but we are uh, very interested in what you have to say. So, look, thank you for that, Bradley. Uh, next week, we will have a, a presenter from Geoscience Australia. It's David Houston, who's actually in the audience here. And what he's going to talk about is findings of recent collaborative research into convergent margin metallogenic cycles, a window to secular change in Earth's tectonic evolution. So that will be 11 o'clock next week, and you can join us here in person or online. But otherwise, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank <laughs> you.